as we continue in our studies in Exodus, the theme of the book is redemption. Uh, after the fall in Genesis, uh, man needed help, and, and God moves in as the uh, mighty Redeemer. And in this particular book, we come now to the 19th and 20th chapters, and we see uh, the Mosaic Covenant being laid down by the Lord. And we're familiar with a lot of uh, parts of this covenant, especially the Ten Commandments. So in chapter 20, we began looking last week at the first two commandments. We want to continue to work our way through the Ten Commandments given by God Himself to the children of Israel. But there is a moral aspect of these commandments that actually communicates to all of the earth. These are, if you will, this is the moral law that God establishes for his universe. Just like he has a physical laws, laws of physics, he has moral laws. And these are ten uh, moral laws that he's kind of laid down in his universe. So we'll study through them, a commandment by commandment, with an understanding. By covenant, they were given to the children of Israel. They're not given to us as Gentiles. And the New Testament makes it plain and clear that there is no commandment or law given that can save one's soul. Because had there been a commandment that could save someone and bring them to salvation, then there would be no need for Jesus Christ to come and to offer his life a ransom for many. It's only the atoning work of Jesus Christ at Calvary's cross, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and by our faith in that work at Calvary is the only way that one can have full redemption for his sin. The Ten Commandments cannot redeem anyone's sin or bring anyone to God. If anything, the Ten Commandments uh, separate us from God. But let us read through and uh, just get an understanding of what God is laying down in the Mosaic Covenant of the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. There is the first commandment, the two-part first commandment. Part A, I am the Lord thy God. The second part, thou shalt have no other gods before me. I didn't mention this last week, but it didn't say thou shalt have no other gods. It said thou shalt have no other gods before me. Why is this? Because the Lord is going to allow people as rulers to be known of as, uh, if you will, gods. Uh, turn to Exodus chapter 22. Exodus chapter 22. Look at verse 28. Thou shalt not revile the gods nor curse the ruler of thy people. In, in the giving here of the civil ordinances to the nation of Israel, it's understood that there will be mighty men who are heads of various tribes, and they will be the rulers of various tribes, and they will be known as gods. So the commandment doesn't say, thou shalt have no other gods, thou shalt have no other gods before me. In, in, in the Lord's uh, system hierarchy of organization, he's going to choose certain people to be in certain positions. And, and they're like gods, if you will, because they're taking the word of God and communicating it to the people. It's the same thing he said to Pharaoh earlier on in this uh, very book that we're reading. I'll see if I can find it for you. Um, Exodus chapter... 7, verse 1. Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh. There it is. In other words, in my hierarchy, Pharaoh sees himself as being high up. In my mind, Pharaoh is below you, Moses. You're above Pharaoh, a, a, a servant, a, an ex-slave from the land of Egypt. You are above him because you're communicating my word to him. That's all right. What's not all right is if any child of Israel 
back in this particular covenant, or today any child of God by faith in Christ Jesus would allow any other God to come before the Lord God, his Redeemer. Can that possibly happen? Well, um, in Christianity it might. One of the goofy things I see sometimes, and one of the things you want to resist, is to allow your pastor to get between you and the Lord. Okay, your pastor, when I was a young Christian, the pastor is the one that uh, took the Word of God and, uh, and expounded it to me in ways I could not understand because he had the teaching gift. And so many times I would come away from a, a session where he would teach and I would, boy, I wish I had seen it like that. I'd like to be able to see it like that. And you, you start lifting that pastor up in your eyes. And what God says is, you just remember, you come to me with your problems. And, and sometimes what would happen is when a problem would come, you'd run to the pastor first, rather than running to God, the Lord God, first. And, and, and that kind of s slips in in a subtle manner. And thou shalt have no other gods before me, even if it's someone that teaches the Bible to you. I am the Lord thy God, commandment number one, part A. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You have a problem, you have a question, you have a sin, you ought to take it to the Lord thy God. Amen. That's, that's the gist he's trying to get across here. Amen. Commandment number one. Commandment number two. Verses uh, back to Exodus chapter 20. Commandment number two. Picking it up in verse four. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. The second commandment has to do with idolatry, the making of graven images, engraving or carving a statue. It's a thou shalt not commandment. Thou shalt not make a graven image. Thou shalt not bow down to a graven image, 5, verse 5. Thou shalt not serve a graven image, verse 5. Three things to do with graven images. Don't make them. <laughs> don't don't uh, bow down to them. Don't serve them. I heard uh, once back in, I don't know if it was the early 1900s, I don't know if Billy Sunday used to do these uh, tent meetings in cities. And after one uh, meeting, he had given a, a, a talk on the Ten Commandments with that fiery style of his. You know, Billy Sunday would preach hard. And, and uh, two uh, society ladies were leaving, and the one walked out in a huff said, well, at least I haven't made any graven images. <laughs> and um, that was about all she could say. Uh, she'd broken every other commandment. And, and in, in this second commandment here, for all we know, she may have bowed down to one or served one. There's more, more to it than just making it. And so this particular commandment, the Lord puts forth. And he, you know, we've looked last week at some of the uh, absurdity of making graven images. I turn to Psalm 115, just to give you an idea. Uh, Psalm 115. Great, great Psalm. We'll just start in verse 1 because it's just terrific to read. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Amen. Unto the name of Jesus Christ, let's give glory in the New Testament. Verse 2. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? People ask, well, where is he? Well, Jesus is resurrected. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's in the heavens. Uh, verse 3, our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. The heathen, verse 4, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes they have, and they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses they have, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they but they walk not, neither speak they through their throat. I mean, the absurdity of making a graven image. I mean, if you make it, you've got to pick it up and put it in its place. It can't even pick itself up. And if it needs to be moved to another room, you've got to get a bunch of people and carry it around. I mean, you're carrying your religion around rather than letting the Lord carry you around. Uh, verse 8, They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. 
What does that mean? Well, let's think. The graven image is dead. <laughs> so are the heathen in their trespasses and sin. They, they need to be born again. The absurdity of graven images. So, so the second commandment given to the children of Israel who have idolatry all around them in the surrounding lands is don't you be like those other folks. Don't you make a graven image. Don't you bow down or serve a graven image. Why? Because he said, I'm a jealous God. That's one of my names. That's one of God's names. Did you know that jealous is one of God's names? Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. This is a nice verse to have. You know why? In case someone knocks on your door and says the only name of God is Jehovah. In case someone knocks on your door and says that one day, you just open your Bible to Exodus chapter 34. And then say, would you please read verse 14 for me? And it says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, there it is, with a capital J, is a jealous God. That, that's uh, one of God's names. That's uh, God speaking, verse 1, same chapter. And the Lord said unto Moses, that's God speaking, and, and there it is. So that's a nice verse to have handy. Uh, a name of God in the Old Testament that he claims is one of his names. His name is Jealous. What does that mean? He has a, a protective love and a zeal for those that are his. And doesn't want anybody or anything to harm or defile that which is his. And idolatry defiles those that are associated with it. I'm a jealous God. And I will visit the iniquity, that inner sin that caused you to make that graven image unto the third and fourth generation of your children. He says, uh, verse 5, Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Idolatry is associated with hating God. If you make an idol or bow down to an idol or worship an idol or serve an idol, you hate God. That, that's what God said. You're a God. But I love God. I love the Lord. In your own mind, with your lips, you faintedly offer praise to Him, but your heart is far from Him. The Lord looketh on the heart. An image maker is a God hater, according to God. Now, this affects children. Idolatry affects children. Let me show you some examples. Turn to the book of Judges, chapter 18. The 18th chapter... Is a, is a chapter that's associated with the 17th. So in the 17th chapter, just quickly, I'll show you in verse 1, then I'm going to show you the key point in the 18. But in the 17th chapter, there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And this particular man had a mother that was an idolater. And the mother gave him money, and he made graven images, and he became an idolater. And then one day... He was visited by the tribe of Dan. And the Danites came and visited him and saw his statues. And this is what the Danites did. They took his statue and they went and they got an, another city that God had not given them called Laish. Uh, take a look at uh, 18th chapter now. 1818. These, these are the Danites, went into Micah's house and fetched the carved image and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. So they took all this and they headed up to this other city called Laish. And uh, verse 29, and they, and they called the name of the city Dan after the name of Dan, their father, who was born in Israel, howbeit the name of the city was Laish at the first. And the children of Dan set up the graven image. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests unto the tribe of Dan unto the day of captivity of the land. And they set them up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. So the tribe of Dan sets up this graven image. And they worship there, and their kids worship there, and their kids' kids worship there for generations, it says. I mean, you're reading about something that happened here in about... Uh, Trying to figure the time frame when this happened. Judges, maybe about 
1400 BC and until the captivity was about about 800, 700 BC. So there are seven centuries of idolatry that Dan got involved with. That's one of the 12 tribes. Now let me show you another tribe that got involved with idolatry. Turn to the book of Hosea, chapter 4. Remember, Micah was from Mount Ephraim. And he had the carved image that his mother had showed him. And then Dan got the carved image. Hosea, chapter 4. Now here's the Lord through the prophet Hosea prophesying to the tribes of Israel and he's talking about the uh, backsliding that's going on. He says in verse 16, 416, For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. And then he says 17, Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim is joined to idols, let them alone. Ephraim is joined unto idols. Let them alone. That's another good verse to have circled in your Bible. You know why? Uh, if you ever have a, meet a Mormon, you know where they say they're from? They're from the tribe of Ephraim. Okay? Mormons will claim their heritage comes from the tribe of Ephraim. So when they come to your door, just let them read Hosea 4.17. All right? Got a couple good verses to deal with JWs and Mormons in tonight's study. Should have them written in the front of your Bible. When J.W. comes to your house, oh, well, let's take a look at uh, Exodus 34, 14. When a Mormon comes to your house, let's take a look at Hosea 4, 17. And uh, they claim they're from the tribe of Ephraim. That's what God thinks of them. They're joined to idols. Let them alone. Now, this is another tribe that got involved in idolatry. What's the effect when God says, Of them that hate me, I will visit the iniquity on their children and their children's children. Turn to the book of Revelation chapter 7. Last book of the Bible, yet to come, Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, after these things, this is after the six seals have been opened, after these things I saw um, the four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth and the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given uh, to hurt the sea and the earth, saying, verse 3, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now this is a time that's yet to come, folks. This is the time of Jacob's trouble. This is the time when God, after the church is taken back to heaven, God will refocus his attention on the nation of Israel and clean up the nation. And he's going to use these preachers Jewish preachers to clean up the nation and to preach the Word of God. He's going to seal 12,000 Jewish preachers from each of the 12 tribes. But watch carefully if you go through these tribes. Verse 5, you'll see Judah, 12,000. You'll see Reuben, 12,000. You'll see Gad, 12,000. Verse 6, you'll see Asher, 12,000. You'll see Naphtali, 12,000. You'll see Manasseh, 12,000. Verse 7, you'll see Simeon, 12,000. Uh, you'll see Levi, 12,000. You'll see Issachar, 12,000. Verse 8, you'll see Zebulon, 12,000. Joseph and Benjamin, 12,000. There's two tribes missing. Do you know who they are? Ephraim and Dan. Let them alone. They're joined to idols. They can't serve me. They can't serve me. None of the children of Ephraim, nor none of the children of Dan will be allowed to carry the word of God and preach in the tribulation. They lost their opportunity to serve God. Idolatry. Visiting the iniquity. Are you an idolater? You, you want to see, turn back from Revelation a few books back to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. The apostle of love. Everybody loves John. Everybody loves Raymond. Everybody loves John. Christians love the book of John. They love the Gospel of John. I love the Gospel of John. I got saved reading the Gospel of John. We use the Gospel of John to, to bring people to the Lord all the time. And we love the epistles of John, the apostle of love. Here he's written a great epistle 
where he says God is love. Everybody says that, by the way. Everybody says God is love. And I have no problem with them saying that. I usually, these are usually lost people that say that. And when they say that, I say, really, where'd you get that idea from? Where'd you get the idea of God's love from? The Bible. I say, have you ever read any of the Bible? Since you got that idea from it, you ought to read some other things in there. God is love. God is also jealous. God is a judge. God is holy. And look how John ends his epistle here in 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. <laughs> look at verse 19. <laughs> Here, God is love. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. There's a little Bible, the same uh, book that says God is love in it. I mean, since they like to quote the Bible, we'll quote some to them. Verse 20, And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Do you know who the only God of the universe is? you know that the only true God is? Just told you in that verse. Jesus Christ. That's the name above every name. The name to which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the true God. I am the Lord thy God, commandment number one. Commandment number two, thou shalt not make a graven image. Look at the next verse. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Amen. That's how he ends. That's how he ends that epistle. Now that you know commandment one, I am the Lord thy God, keep away from commandment number two. Why? In the New Testament, would a Christian possibly be an idolater in the New Testament? Do you know of any Christian churches that have statues or graven images and candles? I can't think of any. That have crosses with people hanging on them? Little children, keep yourself from idols. A amen. Amen. That's New Testament, folks. That's the same book that says God is love. Visit the iniquity to the children and the children's children. I was born a Catholic. I'll die a Catholic. Jesus says you must be born again. Keep yourself mm -hmm. from idols. Mm -hmm. Second commandment. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, continuing in the commandments. They have application today. They'll bring us to Jesus Christ is what they'll do. Exodus chapter 20, commandment number 3, verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. The primary application, the, the number one application, is, is blasphemy. Blasphemy. The, the word blasphemy, the blasphem, is the same root word of blame. And to blaspheme God is to speak impiously, irreverently a God, to blame God for bad things that happen. That's, that's to take the Lord's name in vain. I think that happens down here all the time. When something goes wrong, people blame God. Somebody gets sick, and they blame God. A disaster happens, and they blame God. A tsunami comes, where was God? It's a funny thing. Do you see people rejoicing when they get a new job? Do you see them thanking God for the good things that happen in life when, when a baby is born healthy? Do you see them doing that? When someone gets into college, their kid gets into the college, you see them thanking God? God gets blamed and blasphemed for the bad things that happen on this planet. I remember in my Bible, Genesis chapter 1, when God cre created everything that was good, it was very good. We have a good God. We have a great God. He's not the author of sin. He's not the author of evil. If there's bad things happening on this planet, we ought to look in the mirror. <laughs> Often we're responsible for the choices we make, and they're usually wrong if you're making them in your natural man. And there's just sin abounding in the world. Thankfully, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. But people blaspheme and they blame God. Turn to uh, Psalm uh, 74. The primary application in taking the Lord's name in vain is going to be blasphemy and profanity.
Psalm 74. It is blasphemy to believe in evolution. It, it's, it's, it's speaking irreverently of God. It's throwing him completely out of the equation of the universe. Psalm 74, verse 16. The day is thine. The night also is thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. Thou hast made summer and winter. Remember this, that the enemy hath reproached, O Lord, and the foolish people have blasphemed thy name. Believing that the sun came about from some explosion up there. Believing that the earth was uh, flying around and all of a sudden it cooled down and we have this wonderful, incredible planet that has water and clouds and land masses. Have you ever looked at the planets out there? They're a bunch of dead rocks and dead balls of gas. How do you get something like this? <laughs> A creator that's intimately involved, that has a, that has a, a moon that's exactly about 250,000 miles away so the tides are just right. That has the sun 93 million miles away so that if we were just a million miles closer, we'd burn up. Or a million miles further away, we, we wouldn't have enough heat. I mean, all the things that have gone in this design, and they blaspheme his name. Primary application, blasphemy. Second application, profanity. A compound word, phanis, means the temple. And it's to speak contemptly or obscenely and to curse God's name. To outright curse his name. Take a look at uh, Leviticus uh, chapter 18. Right after Exodus is the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 18. The third commandment, get my thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. I'm sorry if I got it wrong. Be merciful with me. <laughs> the, the name of the Lord. I'm just shortening it a little bit there for writing purposes. The, the applications here are blasphemy and profanity. We saw in Psalm 74, verses 16 through 18, and I, and I, the idea of speaking impiously or irreverently of God. Here in profanity, in Leviticus chapter 18, look at verse uh, 21. Thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire unto Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Now the profanity is to speak against, uh, to swear using God's name. They kind of go together. Turn a couple chapters to the right, Leviticus 24. Watch this, Leviticus 24. Blasphemy and profanity often go together. Profanity is very common down here. Well, so when first we looked at the Leviticus 18.21, I believe I put there. And I want to show you 24. Okay, in the 24th chapter, pick it up around verse 10. Verse 10. An example. And the son of an Israelitish woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel. And this son of the Israelitish woman and a man of Israel strove together in the camp. And the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. So often blasphemy and profanity will go together. Today we hear people cursing in the name of the Lord. Before I was saved, I did it a lot. Some, I, there's a track that I think one of the Fellowship Track League has that says God's last name is not damn. That's one of the tracks they have. And uh, you carry it around the workplace, and if somebody says that, you can give them this little track. And they can read it and learn about what God's real name is, is Jesus Christ. But the cursing, now this, this young man does this. Now uh, watch what happens. Uh, so he blasphemes. And he, and he swears, curses, uh, verse, uh, verse 11 middle, uh, uh, blasphemed and cursed, and they brought him unto Moses. And his mother's name was Shelemeth, a daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. Gee, are we surprised. 
how, how, the, how the breaking of one commandment leads to the breaking of another commandment. Are you surprised? They're like dominoes. He that offends in one point offends in all. That's the truth. So what happens? Verse 12, they put, they put him in ward, that the mind of the Lord... I wonder what God's going to do. He just cursed in, uh, his name and blasphemed his name. 13, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring him forth that hath cursed, bring him forth without the camp. In other words, bring him forth outside of the camp. And let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin, and he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well as the stranger, as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. Verse 22, You shall have one manner of law, as well for the stranger, as one for your own country, for I am the Lord your God. Verse 23, And Moses spake to the children of Israel, that they should bring him forth, that had cursed out of the camp, and stone him with stones. And the children of Israel did, as the Lord commanded Moses. Profanity and blasphemy in the Old Testament, in the land of Israel, where God was living among them. See, God's a holy God. And he doesn't like sin in his presence. Now, now, we're in a new dispensation. We're in the age of grace. We're in the church age. Things have changed. But I just want to give you an idea. What does God think about these things? Maybe God's changed his mind. Malachi 3, 6. I am the Lord. I change not. Amen. Hebrews. Uh, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not alter the thing that's gone out of his lips. We're in a different dispensation. We're not in Israel. And we're not under the law. We're now under grace. But this is how God feels about this. If, if we were under the law today, probably every workplace, every street corner, every school, uh, every bowling alley, every bar room, there'd be enough stones around to build a small house with the kind of cursing and blaspheming that goes on. Now there's a day coming in, in the near future. It, you know, in the present, I just want to show you God's thought on it. Go to Isaiah chapter 52. Because it still goes on. Isaiah chapter 52. You know, people will run around in this planet and they will defend their good name. And if somebody says something about them, they'll bring them up on charges. And bring them into a court of law. What's it that when they when someone does something someone's name and they bring them in a court of law? I forgot the the word that they use. Defamation. defamation of character, defamation of their name, whatever it is. Yeah, people are so concerned about their name. <laughs> so I, you know, I don't have any great name. I mean, I, you, you try and make a good reputation, but so what? But God, <laughs> and His name, God who's holy, God who has never sinned, in all of eternity. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 5. Now therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught, that they that rule over them make them the howl, saith the Lord, and my name continually, every day, is blasphemed. What he was looking at here was he was looking at his people, and he was showing that it was through the prophet Isaiah. He was saying, you know, my people, Israel, Old Testament. Today, my people, the church, New Testament. He's saying, when I look at my people, Israel, they've lost their testimony. They've lost their testimony so much that they're taken away for naught. People look at them and say, ah, a Jew, big deal. No difference between him and a Baal worshiper. And today in the New Testament, a Christian. No difference between him and a Muslim or a Buddhist. And what happens? God's name gets blasphemed when we lose our testimony. God's name gets blasphemed. That's that what was going on then and that's what goes on today. Ah, some Christian he is. And then they use Jesus' name in a way that's uh, not reverent and glorifying and honoring to him. That was what was going on in the past. That what goes on still in the present. Take a look at, for example, David's great Psalm 139. We all love this Psalm. 
This, this got to be one of your favorite psalms in the Bible. I mean, I can't imagine a person whose heart isn't warmed to this psalm, someone who has a personal relationship with the Lord. And in this great psalm where David talks about how the Lord knows him, every word on his tongue, uh, acquainted with him, knew him from the time he was a little baby in, in the mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully made. As he goes through this precious, wonderful psalm, notice what he says uh, in the 20th verse. For they, the bloody men of the last verse, the wicked men of the last verse, they speak against thee, God, they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Now, you ever watch a movie? Do they ever take God's name in vain in a movie? They ever take it in name on television? <laughs> Question is, do they ever not? Is it possible for a Hollywood scriptwriter to write a script without taking the Lord's name in vain? Is it possible for you to go through one day at the workplace and not hear the Lord's name taken in vain? By the way, that's one of the ways I often will um, witness to people at the workplace. I work in a very multicultural workplace. As a doctor, you work at a hospital. You got people from all over with uh, medical degrees from all over the world. And I always hear them saying, the Lord's name in vain. And I don't mean God. I mean Jesus' name. And so one day we were sitting in the, in the lunch place and some guy from Korea was there and a guy from China was there and a guy from South Africa was there and a guy from India was there and I was there. And uh, the, the, one of the Orientals said, Jesus Christ, you know, with that little accent of his. And I, and I said to that guy who kind of would mock me for my faith, I said, why did you use his name? I mean, you're born and raised over there in the East. Why didn't you say Buddha Buddha? <laughs> or why don't you say Muhammad Muhammad? I said, you know why you don't? Because of what it says right there. Thine enemies take thy name, the Lord's name, in vain. Amen. Jesus Amen. is God. Amen. Jesus is the Lord. Amen. And the devil doesn't have them put Buddha Buddha or Muhammad Muhammad because they're not God. Amen or Confucius, Confucius, or Pope, Pope, or whoever it is. Because the devil knows who God is, it's Jesus. And so he puts that little spirit to get them to blaspheme the name of the Lord. It's a good witnessing tool. Amen. Swearing when they take that name of Jesus Christ. I, I was watching a movie with a Jewish guy who's, a, who's a, a devout agnostic. And he would use the name of Jesus Christ sometimes more than a pastor in a pulpit. A lot of pastors and pulpits don't use the name of Jesus Christ nowadays because they don't want to offend folks coming in. But it's the name of Jesus Christ that can save. Amen. And it's Jesus Christ that died for our sins. And, and this guy was using the name of Jesus Christ all throughout the movie. And he wasn't preaching Bible. He's taking the name of the Lord in vain. And it goes on today. I turn to Psalm 109. So God watches this. God doesn't miss this. <laughs> He's a real good accountant up there. He takes account of everything. The books are being written in heaven of every deed and every word and every thought. Psalm 109. This is a rough psalm. This is a psalm about the Antichrist and those who are like the Antichrist and those that follow the spirit of Antichrist. And in this particular psalm, uh, picking it up in, let's say, verse 15, let them be before the Lord continually, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth, because that he remembereth not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart, and as he loved cursing, so let it come into him. Verse 18, as he clothed himself with cursing like a garment, so let it come into his bowels like water and like oil into his bones. Let it be to him as a garment which covereth him. You know, you know, by the fruit of our mouth, we literally weave the robe that we're going to wear for eternity. And by the fruit of our mouth, as we, as we praise and bless and glorify God, he weaves that, that robe of many colors that he puts on us in eternity one day. And these other ones curse and swear, and they're weaving a net and a garment that's going to be cast over them one day. I turn to Revelation chapter 13. Turn to Revelation. I'll show you, show you the end of the story. 
you love the book of Revelation? We know how it turns out. Revelation 13. Verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now this is, this is the world empire and kingdom, and the king of this kingdom coming up in the last days of the tribulation and setting his dominion over the earth, and he blasphemes. And you know what those who take his mark do? Well, they, like father, like son, turn to the 16th chapter. And so what's God going to do with them? Because the age of grace is over now, folks. See, we're in grace right now. But then, in the tribulation, the age of grace is over. And the Ten Commandments revert back. And now watch how God deals with them. Remember what happened to that uh, son of uh, the one woman, the Israelitish woman, that cursed uh, God? Remember what they did? They stoned him. Watch. Verse 21. 1621. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blaspheme God. The blasphemy, God's going to stone them with hail out of heaven. God's going to stone them. He's not going to let people do it. He's going to do it. He's a very good aim. Very good. He rarely misses. He could win the Cy Young Award every year. And you know how much those stones weigh? A talent. You know what a talent is? About 100 pounds. You know what that means? You can run, but you can't hide. He says, he's in his basement over there. Uh, through the roof, through the first floor, through the second floor. Boom, got him. Where's the other guy that, st that, that blasphemed my name? He's over there in Chictawaga. Got him. But that other guy. He's in the Hollywood Hills. Got him. Yeah. Exodus chapter 20. The Lord Jesus Christ. Exodus chapter 20. I'll read the verse and then we'll go to uh, what Jesus says. Um, Exodus 20, 7. Verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Matthew chapter 12, the Lord Jesus, words are read. Well, you know, gentle Jesus, uh, the God of the Old Testament was so rough and judging, and, and Jesus is all love, and he accepts us just the way we are maybe he'll accept you for salvation, then quickly he's going to clean you up and say, go and sin no more. But he's not going to allow you to continue to live in the lifestyle that you came to him in. And here's what he says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. <laughs> Jesus Christ would make a great politician. And now uh, we have uh, for Western New York, uh, uh, poly uh, running for Congress, uh, Jesus Christ. Jesus, a few words for the people. Verse 34, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a Republic. He's running on the uh, Democratic ballot this year. Or the, the Republican, I don't know what ballot. He's not going to get many votes, is he? Speaks right to the heart of the issue. A generation of vipers. How can ye being evil speak good things? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Why do people blaspheme and profane the name of the Lord? Because they have wicked hearts. Because they have wicked hearts. Verse 35. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things. I hope we're praising God. I hope we're glorifying God. I hope we honor God in the way we speak. An evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. And I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Commandment number three. Commandment number three. Commandment number four, verse eight. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do, thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He made it holy. Now, the fourth commandment, we've been reading along, and the first three commandments all had negative aspects to them. Somebody said, I have no problem with the Ten Commandments if they just get rid of all the thou shalt nots and the no's. Okay, well, that, that's eight of them. The first three were negative. Thou shalt have no other gods. Thou shalt not make a graven image. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. And now we get the first positive commandment with something thou ought to do. And you're going to find that this particular commandment right here is the sign, the seal of the Mosaic Covenant. This is the part of the covenant that the people were to positively show forth and keep as a sign between them and God that they would keep the Mosaic Covenant. The positive commandment given right here, the fourth one, remember the Sabbath day. This is given unto them for a few reasons, but I want to show you this is the sign or the seal of the covenant. Let me show you a few places to confirm that. Uh, Exodus 31. And then we'll go to Ezekiel chapter 20. But first, Exodus 31. Look at verse 12 and 13 in particular. Verse 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 13, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. So, so he's saying in that 13th verse, 31, 13, a nice mirror image, kind of like a palindromic sequence, 3, 1, 1, 3. He's saying this is the sign of the covenant between you and me. Verily, my Sabbaths shall ye keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. <laughs> we're running out of time, Joey says, so we're going to look more at this fourth commandment next week, and uh, we'll look at Ezekiel 20. But you want to understand, this particular commandment is misunderstood. There are people running around today, there are quote-unquote Christians, trying to run around today, trying to keep this particular commandment, and this is a sign of the Mosaic Covenant, the Conditional Covenant, the Revocable Covenant given in Exodus 19 and 20. It has nothing to do with us. And we'll look at some of the absurdity next. It's amazing how bad teaching gets around. <laughs> it's amazing how we fall for every wind of doctrine that comes along. But this is a sign of the Mosaic Covenant. Okay, we're running out of time. Any questions on what we looked at tonight? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the... Uh, the Word of God. Thank you for helping us by thy Spirit to rightly divide the Word of Truth as we study to show ourselves approved unto thee. Lord, uh, thank you that the Ten Commandments were given to show us our need for the Savior. As a schoolmaster, may they bring us to Jesus Christ for salvation, and may they keep us close to Christ every day of our lives, and may we always honor the name that we pray in, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.